Welcome back to Christine's Corner. Um, my guest, I've had her on before. Um, this is Professor Olana Lennon. Uh, she's from the U University of New Haven. And uh, what do you teach? Do you want to tell them what you yeah, teach? Yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, I teach in the National Security Department. So I teach uh, foreign policy, and national security, international relations, um, things like that. That's powerful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, with your accent, you know, she's from um, Ukraine. And um, that is when you came on before, you talked about the war in Ukraine a year later. Um, it's now been about approximately a year and a half, as we were just talking about. Um, has things changed, improved the same? Um, have you been there, or when's the last time? I know it's a lot of questions all at once, but yeah, no. I mean, I, I I've gone back a few times. I was actually just there uh, maybe two weeks ago, uh, but things have um, improved in some ways and um, probably deteriorated in other ways. Um, Ukrainians, since we last talked, um, Ukrainians have launched a major counteroffensive, so they're about five months into it. Um, it has gone slower than expected, but uh, part of the reason why was because, you know, the Russians have had enough time to really dig in and put up really strong defenses. So Ukrainians are up against um, heavily mined fields and uh, deeply entrenched Russian forces um, that they have to clear literally, you know, meter by meter. So, um, and, you know, what we're finding now really is that as much as you know, the West and America, you know, is, is the leading uh, provider of military aid. Um, what, you know, where the Ukrainians have found themselves is that some of the weapon systems um, that they needed five months ago are just now beginning to um, arrive. arrive um, oh, from the United States? From the, from, from the United from States and the partners. You know, most of these weapons are American made, uh, but they're also supplied by, you know, NATO uh, partners um, right. and Ukraine supporters. So so in that way, I, I think what you could say that the fact that um, you know, Russia continues to suffer tremendous losses and, and the Ukrainian defenses have also gotten much stronger. Um, so in, in, in that way, you could say that the Ukrainians have done pretty well defending uh, the front line. But at the same time, they would have, of course, preferred to, uh, you know, everybody would have liked to see uh, a little bit more progress. But, you know, they're getting there. I think that now it's pretty clear that any further delay um, in providing Ukraine with, you know, all the weapons that it needs um, would only result in, in, in more deaths, more destruction, and potentially uh, will allow Russia to dig in even deeper, you know, uh, reorganize its forces, um, restrike, um, you know, re regroup, and potentially um, uh, execute an all-out offensive again. So on, on, on the uh, negative side, what we're seeing because of uh, escalation between Israel and Hamas and, and uh, and the horror that's unraveling there and, and all the civilians that have been caught in crossfire on both sides um, because of that major development. Of course, it is another global event. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that the Russians are taking advantage of that uh, momentum and they're actually now, for the first time really, um, in, in the past at least six months, they're, they're now on the offensive again. Um, they've been on the defense for a while while, but they're now going all out um, against Ukrainian forces, um, trying to 
recapture as much territory as, as possible while the world, you know, quote, quote, is distracted. And of course, yeah. you know, Israel-Hamas war um, is, is, is horrific and, and it's uh, problematic in its own right. Um, I don't, as, as tempting as it might be to, you know, to correlate the two, I know some people really read into the timing of it and, and see, um, you know, Russia's um, evil doing and, and the coordination between Iran and Russia. I, I, I wouldn't go that far, um, but it is pretty clear that, um, you know, uh, that Russia is taking advantage of this, um, of this destabilization and, and of this chaos in the Middle East. And of course, they're blaming the United States uh, for their failed Middle Eastern policy. Um, so I think they uh, who's now- Who's blaming the United States? I'm sorry? Who's, who's blaming the United States? <laughs> it, it's Russia's hobby. Right. Um, um, right. Russia, Russia uh, tends to blame the United States yeah. for right. destabilizing the world, and they uh, they see the war in um, in the middle in the Middle East right now, uh, particularly obviously between Israel and, Israel and Hamas, but also the potential of another front opening up um, up north, involving Hezbollah. So the Russians um, see failed policy of the United States in um, um, in that region as as the main. Um, reason why you know we're seeing so much instability and you know in, in many ways um, sort of two existential wars happening at the same time yes, uh, with no of, end in sight yeah. yeah is it coincidental is it Russia instigating Hamas are they helping them well you, know, you wonder again. what's going on you don't know but it just yeah like you said Right. I mean, everybody is Timing. playing their. You know, everybody is taking advantage of of, of this uh, to their own advantage. Obviously, again, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to suggest with you know any um, uh, certainty that you know Russia. This, this was of Russia's doing, right, uh, but what right. we do know, um, in terms of timing, in terms of why it happened in the, in the middle of Ukraine's counteroffensive, I don't necessarily correlate those two events uh, that directly. But what we do know is that uh, Russia has been cooperating with Iran specifically, and that that's well documented. Um, and and uh, and the Russians are in pretty good terms with Hamas. As a matter of fact, uh, right. just today. Um, Hamas leaders were in Moscow negotiating the release of hostages. There were some Russian citizens among hostages held by Hamas, um, and uh, you know they're actually in direct conversation with Russian leaders on um, exchange of hostages and and uh, and, and and various other um, you know avenues of cooperation. And the Russians cooperated with Hamas prior to the war uh, as well, but the Russians also cooperate with Iran. Iran is one of the main suppliers of uh, these cheap drones, Shahed drones, to Russia that the Russians have been using to strike civilian um, and military infrastructure in, in Ukraine. Um, so that connection is well documented. So it's not a conspiracy theory to say that right. um, that Russia has Iran's back and vice versa. Um, now that is not to say that you know uh, that Russia took any part in you know, sp you know in planning or executing this attack. But I think what it is clear is that um, they are uh, very much um, again exploiting this opportunity to while the attention is diverted uh, to go all out you know to launch this major offensive in particularly in Avdiivka in in Donetsk region um, where there's major fighting going on right now um, but you know the so but Russia also is is a, one of the main global disruptors, yes. even if it's not directly involved um, in you know sponsoring Hamas. But again, I wouldn't necessarily rule that out. Uh, but you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't have any evidence of that. But uh, you know, what we do know for sure is that you know Russia is a global destabilizer. It is a global disruptor. Right. Um, it it uh, exploits opportunities like that to distract the West. You know, to in inflict multiple dilemmas on uh, on the West, um, and uh, you know, strike where it, it needs to strike, or you know, undermine the power of the West in in areas that Russia considers of of primary importance to them. I, I also heard that um, the Russian people, the civilians, um, they are not um, for the war at all. They they don't like the bombing going back and forth, and they can't even get out to get away from it. 
Right. Uh, the Russians are suffering from this as well. Um, obviously, you know, there is zero tolerance on dissent. There is no free media. Um, there is, um, even though there is no full mobilization in effect, uh, there is still indirect mobilization um, that uh, is really hard to avoid. You know, it's a criminal offense. So the economy is down. Obviously, Russia has been, um, you know, it has been the pariah state uh, for you know at least the last couple of years. Um, you know, a lot of businesses have left Russia. You know, the Russians can't really travel um, outside the country, nor um, can they easily even enter, you know, many of the European countries. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that the public opinion in Russia has been necessarily uh, one or, you know, on average uh, of strong condemnation of the war. So I think that one thing that um, you know, we have not necessarily seen um, to the level that everybody expected was the, the, the Russians you know, protesting against and with the understanding that it's not as easy to protest in Russia. Um, it is a police state, um, even more so now. Um, but, you know, the, the public opinion surveys that we do have available to us, you know, Levada is one of the more um, sort of uh, reliable independent uh, survey companies uh, in Russia that does survey Russian uh, residents. Um, but, you know, you, ha you have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, we we're not sure if they're necessarily telling their honest opinions. But what mm. we have seen is that uh, support of Putin has not necessarily diminished. Um, it's just that the Russians uh, have been conditioned to believe that um, it is not uh, their job to, it, it's not up to the people to interfere into you know, foreign uh. or domestic policy, that the government does what it needs to do. And uh, for as long as people stay out of politics, they can enjoy more or less you know, a, a good life in Russia. That's what the social contract uh. is like um, in, in Russia. So no, I don't think the Russians have been vocal enough. Um, we have not seen um, enough opposition or at least condemnation of the war. Um, even, you know, with the understanding that it's difficult. Um, the, the Russian media is entirely controlled by the Russian government. So the Russians, uh, all they hear all day is that uh, this is NATO's war against Russian civilization that, um, you know, the reason the Russian forces are doing so poorly was because they're fighting against NATO, not against Ukraine, so, and the Ukrainians are just pawns uh, in NATO's um, hands. Brainwashed and exactly. power and control. So, they're, I mean, they're not, you know, they're not getting the same information, obviously. Their view of this war um, is, is very different. Um, so call it propaganda or, you know, conditioning, but it is what it is. You know, it, again, um, I wouldn't say that the Russians, we don't know. I, don't, I, I really don't know no. how, how much to trust the you know, public opinion surveys, but what we do know um, is that uh, Putin, Putin's leadership remains unchallenged. Yeah. Putin's um, prospects for winning a re-election next year, uh, is the next presidential election in Russia, is right now seem uh, pretty good because he, it's not expected that this election will be contested. No. There's absolutely no opposition in, in Russia. Um, the only um, sort of viable opponent, uh, Alexei Navalny, who's currently in jail, um, it has been for a while. Um, so again, there is no expectation that the Russian society or the Russian regime uh, will change in any significant ways anytime soon. I'm sure he has power and control over over the uh, the service too of uh, saying uh, it's going to be me, and if not, I'm going to kill you or whatever he does. So so that he remains in power, as you said. Right, that's what dictators yeah. do. Right, yeah. that that's um, you know that is an a kleptocratic regime um, that has consolidated power for for the last at least twenty years that Putin has been in power. Right, um, and the system, right? Yeah, wow. and the system is designed uh, to be uh, you know coup proof, so to speak, uh, uh, to be uh, um, you know pretty resistant against popular uprisings or uh, any uh, insurrections uh, or you know, military coups. So it's, it, again, again, the information um, is entirely controlled by the Kremlin. Um, uh, political elites, military elites um, uh, are controlled by the Kremlin. So in that way, there's really no dissent um, and there is no expectation. Again, there, there are no signs in place right now that would 
you know, indicate otherwise. Um, um, the uh, president of the Ukraine, the leader of the Ukraine, um, he's. It seems to me he's doing an um, excellent job. I mean, I don't know how he gets in and out of the country, but um, and I, I worry about the Ukraine people as as we all do. Um, I mean, um, to keep them them safe. I mean, they don't care if they tear down the whole buildings like they're doing in um, Israel and got you know all there. So. Um, do you? I was just wondering. Kira, do you have family there as well? I mean, are, how how's your family doing there? Um, they're they're doing okay. I mean, nobody. Um, everybody's struggling in Ukraine, but people are, um, you know, doing what they can. They're they try to um, keep up in a good spirit and and uh, being optimistic. Um, but, you know, obviously it's hard um, because, especially now going into the winter, um, you know, Russia's favorite instrument of power, it seems, um, is uh, leveraging energy against civilians and um, governments. So now, you know, last winter we, we saw that the, the, the first wave of attacks on energy infrastructure, um, and it was you know, specifically designed to target civilian areas so to so that civilians would be demoralized and kind of flee in larger numbers, put additional pressure on their leaders. Um, but, you know, Ukrainians are, you know, resilient. Of course, I mean, there are limits. Of course, they're suffering. So I don't want to downplay uh, the, just uh, the, the, the strife of the Ukrainian people. Um, oh, you can tell they definitely are, um, they're not going to give up, they're, you know, very. They don't have a choice. Um, they're not going to give up, but they also recognize that uh, giving up would only prolong the war. Um, and, you know, everybody who's fighting, everybody who, you know, my, my friends and colleagues, who former teachers, journalists, writers, uh, doctors who had to become soldiers, um, looking at this as, um, as their way of ensuring a better future for their children, because they believe that if they don't, if they quit now, if they don't finish this fight, then their children will be fighting the exact same war. That there is absolutely no signs that would indicate that Putin will, or the next Russian successor, um, will change their foreign policy or they will stop using military power uh, to achieve their foreign policy objectives. Uh, there's, again, absolutely no indication of that right now. Um, and we have also seen how Russia governs in Ukraine in occupied territories. Um, and it's, it's basically ethnic cleansing and, and zero tolerance on all things Ukraine. Right. Um, so Ukrainian citizens are, are, are going to be uh, not just um, oppressed and repressed, but, you know, um, Killed in 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 any occup if if they don't completely um, surrender and and uh, follow orders, uh, which obviously you know Ukrainians are, are not keen to do, and a lot of people don't have a choice to to leave. You know, I know that um, under you know perfect circumstances, um, it would have been great to evacuate everybody from from these um, you, know, um, you know zones of of, of hot war. Um, you know, near the front line, but you know, not all civilian, civilians can afford um, to move, or you know, can leave their family members behind. So, I mean, there's there's still a lot of civilians who are trapped in these war zones. Um, but the, what we do know is that if Russia were to you know, eventually occupy and hold these territories, then there would be a massive ethnic cleansing that would only mm. create. More That's problems. Horrible. Obviously, it's, it's, it would be, uh, of, you know, uh, tragic and, and horrific um, on, on many levels. But it would also um, create problems for the U.S. You know, I think now, um, you know, as you know, we're going through our own political turmoil here yes. in the U.S. Right. Um, and so I know we have the new speaker now. So hopefully, you know, you know, we will start. You know, the U.S political apparatus will start functioning a little bit more um, in a more organized fashion. But um, obviously with Israel now, um, the Israel-Hamas war opening up again, um, it's, um, you know, it, it is going to create additional um, 
burdens on the U.S. defense spending um, and on um, even, even political resources. But I think now is the time to really uh, keep up the support and, and scale up the support uh, for Ukraine, not scale it down, because any, uh, any indication, any decrease in, um, in the current levels of support will only set Ukraine back. Uh, it will send the wrong signal to our uh, enemies and allies um, that, you know, that Western allies and the United States in particular are not committed, that they're not reliable partners. So that would be the wrong signal to send now uh, when we're seeing, obviously, um, you know, multiple wars unraveling at the same time, but also increasing levels of coordination and cooperation between Iran, China, and Russia. So that would only incentivize um, you know our main opponents to uh, to further integrate their um, um, their you know malign uh, actions, so to speak, um, against the United States. So mm. now is the time to keep the pressure up um, and to continue supplying Ukraine and Israel at the same time because we can. You know the uh, I know there's a lot of concerns about you know whether the United States can um, can sustain. Um, this level of commitment to Ukraine and to Israel at the same time. Currently, um, and as the Biden administration has said many times, um, we are more than capable of sustaining these two war efforts because they're, Israel and Ukraine have qualitatively different needs. Um, these are two different wars, and the U.S.'s support of Ukraine does not come at the expense of the U.S.'s ability to support Israel. So I think that that, that, just, that, that should be made as clear as possible that they're not, these are not mutually exclusive right. um, problem sets, um, that the, the U.S. is, is uh, um, well positioned um, and well resourced. Uh, all it lacks is political will right now. Of course, the, the timing is unfortunate because we're gearing up for elections. Yes. And Usually, you know, it's not uncommon, unfortunately, for, um, you know, in uh, pre-election times to use foreign aid, especially foreign military aid, yeah. um, for, um, you know, uh, to delineate political positions and uh, undermine opponents. Uh, and this is kind of what I see the, the, the Republicans uh, are doing right now. They are, um, you know, uh, I think trying to spin this narrative that, that Ukraine that military aid for Ukraine may not be the best investment, um, and you know the Biden administration might have not um, kind of instituted proper uh, monitoring and accountability measures. That you know we don't know where these weapons are. Um, are going and where they're going to end up, we do, actually. You know, the accountability and monitoring is, is in place. Um, but I think that what, what is kind of unfortunate is to see how military aid is being politicized yes. for domestic political purposes. And I think we should kind of expect that because that's part of American political culture, but at the same time be informed enough and be uh, um, um, aware of how these narratives get amplified and acquire a life of their own so that we don't you know fall for um for, for, for that for those narratives and um suffer from the so-called ukraine fatigue um again mm. this would this would be a disservice not just to ukraine but to american national security uh to scale down support for ukraine now given the progress it has made because um, the uh, the alternative to Ukraine losing more uh, more territory or giving Russia any operational pause is so much worse and so yeah. much more costly than sustaining Ukraine, not just sustaining Ukraine in this fight, but making sure that Ukraine actually achieves its objectives. Um, yeah. th that is a much better investment for the U.S. Um, and, and I think we should you know always be mindful of that. Um, yeah, and mainly the well, I, I'm all the very good points, and I thank you for uh, telling us all this. Um, the I, I just worried about all the people being killed, no, you know, all, all political stuff, and no one cares. Well, I can't say no one. I'm just saying, you know, Russia doesn't care if it's a child or their babies or children or who they are, and that's uh, that's sad that they use people to get their power. And, and justice, and uh, I hope that we all can help each other, and it continues on. 
Uh, I, I thank you for bringing what you, you brought to yeah. us. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, and I really appreciate you continuing to shed light on the uh, on these developments and uh, informing your audiences um, about the events in Ukraine because they affect all of us. And you're right, ultimately it's the civilians, it's the, the women and children who are suffering the most um, as you know, families are separated because all, you know, there's a lot of casualties, obviously, um, but the um, you know people end up being uh, the, the ultimate victims of the war, and and they're trapped in this in in, in Russia's you know delusions about um, you know what Putin is trying to achieve. Um, so, and I do I do appreciate the, the efforts that you have put into educating you know domestic audiences here. Um, but also caring. Um, uh, it's um, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of bad things happening to a lot of people around the world, and yeah. sometimes it may seem as though we just uh, we, we're helpless, but we're not helpless. No. Um, and and I, I, I appreciate your efforts. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, it just get, I, I just can imagine when you tell me that their um, their power, the electric, they don't have electricity, they won't have heat, and it's going to get colder. You know, how do they? Uh, I know we're, we'll survive, but it's just ho hor horrific, you know, you don't see the human part of it, and then war is just horrible, and peace, <laughs> I just saw it. Yes. peace in the world. Yes, wars so. are horrible, and we can, we have the power to, uh, to end it and, and prevent future wars um, if we um, find enough political will in us, you know, I, I, I think if there's anything that the last two years have taught us is that indecisions are consequential. You know, that every time, as we delay decision making, it, it only, problems only, they don't go away. No. They don't take care of themselves. Sadly. Uh, so. They, um, we, um, I, I, I think um, as Americans, we, uh, we need to be a more, um, aware of um, how consequential even our own indecisions can be and and be ready to take more risks um, because yeah. um, they um, you know th this is the right time to to use the resources that we have um, and not expect things to take care of themselves well I thank you again we've run out of time sadly and I love uh, all the information that you bring to us and to them. So I thank you, and I thank you. Please come back again. Thank um, you. Love you, and peace be with to you and the world. Nagal Casino right here at the East Side Restaurant. We always have the complete full dinner menu. Knockwurst, bratwurst, sour broughton, potato pancakes, red cabbage, rice pudding, cream pies, all the desserts that Germany had to offer. I always do something different. Yes, I do. I brought seafood to the beer garden at the East Side Restaurant. East Side Restaurant, your German destination restaurant in Connecticut. Tiggy Tucky, Tiggy Tucky, hoi, hoi, hoi! I'm your host, Kurt Barwis. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Lynn. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wooden. Decision for ourselves for this week, if we want to be made well. Hi, welcome to the crack of dawn. It's Dawn Lombardi. I'm starting the painting. It's going to be the clips with some water. Love it. He took me on the sets of Lost in Space, Batman. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Until next time.